Senator Dean Smith, Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Implementation of the National Redress Scheme, and I'll open this public hearing for today. Uh, in accordance with the Committee's resolution of the 5th of December 2019, this hearing will be broadcast on the Parliament's website, and the proof and official transcripts of proceedings will be published on the Parliament's website. I also remind members of the media who may be present or listening on the web of the need to fairly and accurately report the proceedings of the committee. I welcome officials from the Department of Social Services for their cooperation and participation this morning. I'll now ask each of the officials to uh, introduce themselves uh, for the Hansard purposes. Liz Heffernwerk, Deputy Secretary, Families and Communities, Department of Social Services. Emma Kate McGuire, Group Manager, Redress, Department of Social Services. Sharon Stewart, Branch Manager, Redress, Policy, Strategy and Design, Department of Social Services. John Riley, Branch Manager, External Engagement, Redress Group, Department of Social Services. Thank you very much. Joining us today from the committee is myself as the Chair, Senator Dean Smith, Ms Sharon Clayton, the Deputy Chair, Senator Rachel Siebert, Ms Celia Hammond. We are expecting Mr Milton Dick to join us uh, later and we are also scheduled to have Senator Louise Pratt join us uh, when she does arrive. I will um, invite the Department to make an opening statement. If there is no opening statement, I'll ask Ms Clayton to begin with questions. Thank you, um, Chair. I'll just make a brief opening statement if that's okay. Um, yes, please. So um, I just wanted to note that uh, in June 2020, the National Redress Scheme rules were amended to revise the time frame for non-government institutions to join until 31st December 2020. The rule has now been amended further to extend the date until 31st January 2028 for all non-government institutions to join the scheme. So there's no longer any Sorry, time limit. States. Sorry? I'm just up there. You just, all your audio cut out for me. It's Sharon Clayton speaking. Sorry. Um, could you just repeat the dates to which the um, time frame has been extended? So it's now been extended to the 31st of January 2028. So to, to the end of the scheme, of, of all months, yeah, six months before the end of the scheme, effectively. I, um, should, is it all right if I proceed? If yes, you continue sorry, to look, proceed, I but I'll, I'll just ask. I'll just ask colleagues and witnesses to speak slowly uh, to avoid unnecessary interruption so that we can hear the evidence as best as possible. The reception is very poor. I've asked the Secretariat to explore that, but if we speak calmly, purposefully and avoid unnecessary interruption, we might be able to endure. Thank you, Chair. Approximately 158 institutions that have been named in an application or in the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sex Abuse and who have provided an intent to join the scheme had until 31st December 2020 to join. Of those 158 institutions, as at the 15th of January, 2021, 103 of those non-government institutions have now been declared as members of the scheme. 31 institutions will be declared in Declaration 1 2021 due to the department being unable to finalise their administrative requirements by the 31st of December 2020. 10 NGIs have been assessed by the department as being unable to meet the legislative requirements of the scheme and 14 institutions have been reprioritised due to a change in the status of applications relating to them. Institutions deemed unable to meet the legislative requirements of the scheme 
are not subject to sanctions where they have worked collaboratively with the Department of Social Services in an attempt to join the National Redress Scheme. The Department continues to actively work with NDI, assessors unable to join and explore options to put them in a position to meet the legislative requirements. Importantly, should the institution's circumstances change in the future, the Department will work with the institutions to assist them to complete the necessary steps to participate in the scheme. We continue to work with state and territory governments also on the potential for changes to funder of last resort arrangements. The Commonwealth and all jurisdictions are conscious of the extensive consultations currently undertaken as part of the second anniversary review of the scheme and want to ensure any policy considerations relating to funder of last resort are informed by the findings of the review. That was the only statement I wish to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Clayton, would you like to begin with some questions? Uh, uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you for your evidence. Unfortunately, I could only hear maybe a third of it. So pardon if I am asking questions that you just spoke to in your opening statement. Could I just clarify, um, if I heard you correctly, there were 10 non-government organisations that cannot currently meet the legislative requirements to join the scheme. Was that correct? So there are 10 of the 158 institutions that had signalled an intent to join that cannot join. There's right. also one further, there's one further institution I'll just mention, which is the Lakes Entrance Pony Club, which had originally declined to join. It has now been attempting to join and we have determined that it is unable to meet the requirements of the scheme. So there's 11 in total. Thank you. Um, can I ask if they are, um, in terms of their inability to meet the legislative requirements, are they um, all in the same... Um, getting feed. But are they all going to apply because they can't assure um, financial capacity for the life of the scheme? or are there a variety of reasons? Um, so um, they're, they all have the same issue, but I'm not, I don't think I can say what that issue is without breaching the um, current protected information guidance. Okay. Um, well, I will take you to a reported example, uh, and that is the Retta Dixon home in uh, Darwin. And, and uh, it has been uh, that that um, institution came in under the um, umbrella of the Australian Indigenous Ministries AIM, and they have been seeking to as it's reported, they've been seeking to join the scheme, uh, but have been told that they um, don't have enough, it's believed that the organisation doesn't have enough money to adequately pay out potential claimants, um, and that under the Act, uh, you know, they weren't able to demonstrate this capacity to pay redress for both current and possible potential future applicants over the life of the scheme. So, um, so if that is the, um, that if they all, this is Rita Dixon, one of the 11 uh, organisations that you are referring to? Uh, so, yes, the Australian Indigenous Ministries is one of the 11. Yes, and sorry, AIM, yep. Yes, yeah, they, are, they are one of the 11 um and there's a process we go through a financial viability assessment they provide us details with their of their kind of full financial 
status and the nature of any assets they have. And yeah. um, I can't comment on an individual case, but that, that they've obviously said said something publicly. Yeah. I'm not um, pushing you on that. I'm just um, wanting confirmation that they're one of those 11 and they are on the record very clearly stating what they understand to be the barriers are preventing them from joining the scheme. And uh, so I'm interested, um, uh, you know, I know my colleagues will no doubt have some questions on Fairbridge and some other bodies, but um, could you talk to us about um, really what, um, what discuss, are there any discussions underfoot? Have you been asked by the Minister or the Government, for example, to look at um, the, um, funder of last resort provisions and whether there uh, need to be or any other alternative options are being explored to be able to provide redress for those that are uh, currently uh, excluded through, you know, no obvious fault of their own. Thank you. Um Yes, we have been asked to examine funder of last resort provisions. Um, I'll just note that the second anniversary review is also considering funder of last resort, and that will be uh, the review will be finalised in late February. Um, but yes, we have been asked. The ministers have been discussing that. Um, State, Territory and Commonwealth Ministers about the current provisions, um, whether the current provisions could um, potentially be uh, extended to cover all, uh, additional circumstances. So we've been in discussions with jurisdictions about that, as well as seeking the view through the second anniversary review. Um, are you, uh, do you have any concern that there is a, like, is there any uh, obstacles in, sorry, let me start again. Um, given that the second anniversary review is underway, um, are there um, any kind of um, issues around matters? At the moment, or is it helpful? I don't. I don't understand your working relationship with the review at all. So, sorry, I may have missed part of the question. So, okay. um, the review with the review. Do you, can um, you? I, I, it might be helpful if you could just refresh um, my memory at least, or explain to the committee um, the working relationship between yourself and the second anniversary review, if any. Thank you. So the review is an independent review. Um, Ms Robin Crook was appointed to lead that review. The secretariat for the review has been um, provided by the Department of Social Services, but that's being kept independent from the operation of the redress scheme. Um, the reviewer has met with us and um, discussed, uh, you know, asked questions, followed up matters as she has met with other institutions, state, territory, uh. governments, and also with a large survivor, group of survivors and their representatives. She has um, provided a interim report. Um, so we are kind of um, looking at that interim report, we will have the opportunity to provide comment on that interim report. And then there'll be a, okay. so it's an independent review, but we are, we are working with the reviewer to try and um, make sure um, she has all the information and um, that she needs from us. And, yep. and our Can I ask you? Of... Sorry. Do you expect uh, you are on the same page when it comes to exploring the uh, potential to expand um, or revisit the funder of last resort provisions? 
I think I think yes, that that would be a fair assessment. I think um, both Robin Cook and our minister and our department are, um, you know, so, um, all think that this this situation where people can't join is not um, not satisfactory, not a happy situation, and one that we are really all keen to try and find a way through. Um, and so, yes, I would say we are on. We have similar views. Yep. Thank you. And uh, look, can you um, just advise me how many um, survivors, how many applications you've received that are that currently cannot progress? Uh, in light of the fact that the uh, institutions have um, not, well, two categories really, uh, in light of those institutions that haven't met the current legislative requirements and cannot become participants of the scheme because of that, uh, and have, um, uh, I guess have still signalled, uh, they have joined, but if I understood you, and I'm sorry, Ms. Heffron Webb, I really couldn't hear your evidence very well at all, but you may have covered it. Whether I understand, I think I heard you saying there are people who have said that they, they have actually signed up, but for whatever reasons, they haven't become, um, you know, they haven't been declared as fully full participants yet. That's right. So I'm interested in um, how many applicants are being held up by those two different categories now. I'll just pass to Mr. Riley to answer that question. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. So 362 applications are on hold as at least one institution named in the application is yet to join. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. So, so the scheme's dealing with 4,246 applications which it has on hand as at the 15th of January. Of those, 362, yep. so 362 are on hold as at least one institution named in the application is yet to join. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I just, sorry, could I just clarify that? How many of those 362 are in those two groups that, that Ms Clayton just asked about? either reprioritised or not able to meet requirements? So of the, um, of the 11 NGIs who are unable to join the scheme, that relates to 24 applications. Uh -huh. Can I just ask and what the other case The reprioritised one. In relation to the reprioritised groups, um, there are no applications on hold in relation to those groups where we refer to a change in the status of applications naming those institutions. We generally mean that the application has either been withdrawn or in some instances progressed without that institution. Thank you. Thanks. I, I lost a bit of that as well. Sorry, but um, I think my final um, uh, well question just for now um, is around the um, what what steps um, are being uh, taken now uh, to work with those 11 institutions that you identified? Like, do you sort of, um, could you just talk us through the steps that are being taken? I know you're, you've said you're talking. Certainly. Last um, resort provisions. Um, so in relation sorry, to- I to say something. In relation to those 11 institutions, uh, 
the department continues to monitor any change in their financial situation uh, or indeed uh, yep. any change in the potential redress liability that they have. And we continue to explore alternative arrangements for those institutions with related bodies, uh, if, if I can use that broad term. Um, and those those negotiations and conversations are ongoing. There is um, quite a range of institutional types within that list of 11. Yes. Would you, uh, I'm just going to use the example of AIM again because that was the one I, that we has been publicly reported and um, I'm just wondering, have you got any appreciation of the extent to which, um, you know, how many institutions um, were under that umbrella? Like I've named the Rita Dixon home, but there might well be others um, sitting under the AIM um, umbrella. And um, have you got a, a sense of the... Um, potential extent of, of exclusion. I mean, the most important Dixon home would definitely have been um, predominantly um, First Nations uh, uh, children and mostly Stolen Generations kids. Um, do you know if AIM have got other institutions that likewise would not be able to be signed up to the scheme because AIM cannot under the current legislative requirements? So, so we're aware that the, the Australian Indigenous Ministries has uh, parts of its organisation in three separate jurisdictions. Uh, our main, at, based on applications received to date and and what we know from the Royal Commission, our main concern is in relation to the Reda Dixon home. I'm, I'm sorry, I really hear you. I, I might hand across to the... Um, uh, one, uh, one can hear me sitting in um, uh, an email that was sent out to that uh, asked people to participate in a consultation of a, um, a review of some of the forms that the National Redress Scheme is using. I think there were three forms. Um, one was the redress nominee form. One was one was applying from jail form. Um, I'm wondering what uh, lessons were learnt from that consultation process regarding changes you've made to the forms. Can you advise the committee of lessons learnt? Um, Sharon Stewart, Branch Manager, Redress Policy, Strategy and Design. Um, we haven't finalised the work on those particular forms yet, but um, I would characterise the feedback as being very consistent around simplifying both the structure and language in the forms that we use um, and making sure the need to make sure that we properly explain the terminology that we use where it's particular to the scheme and to the legislation. Um, that, that's been consistent um, for those forms and for um, some of the others we've been asking for comments on. And uh, finally, it was um, asked at the committee why there is a practice to um, send out those emails that are just signed off as a generic, you know, from the National Redress Scheme. There's not a person identified, you know, the email's not coming from a particular contact person within NRS or... Um, do you have a, um, a response to that? I mean, I've seen the email, all committee members have. 
had us signed off by um, National Redress Scheme, but no name or contact number or anything attached to it. Is that a um, is that a standard practice or is that something unusual? Um, so uh, it leads to from where um, we can um, check. With, uh, as my understanding is that it has been standard practice for the redress scheme, um, but I, we will confirm that for you on notice if that's all right. I just okay. don't have. And if it is standard um, practice, so I guess the kind of explanation as to why it's a an issue that gets raised with us from time to time about just having, you know, personal kind of engagement so that um, uh, if you could um, provide, if it is standard practice, provide the rationale as to why you wouldn't have an officer identifying themselves and being a point of contact for the service providers, that would be very helpful. Yes, we, we, will, we will provide the, that on notice and sorry, sorry, Deputy Chair. Yeah, no, 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 that's okay. I'm going to... Um, hand back to the chair because um, my audio is terrible and uh, they, you might have better luck with some of my other committee members being able to hear your responses. So uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Clayton. Senator Seward. Uh, and just Thank before you. Senator Seward, I'd like to welcome Milton Dick who has joined the committee hearing also. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Chair. Can I go back to the 24 applications? And I and I um, missed a little bit of the answer to one of Miss um, Clayton's questions, which was what uh, and where you were talking about um, what's happening with those 24 applications. And I'm just wondering, could you just uh, could you just go through that? as to uh, what happens to those 24 applications now. Thank you, Liz from speaking. So we have spoken to all the applicants um, in relation and explained that the institution that they've named in their application is not able to join, that we are working with the institutions and we'll continue to work with the institutions. Um, and of course, if they have um, other institutions listed on their application, they may say that they wish to proceed now without AIM or the relevant institution. Um, but yes, we've, we've been in touch with all of those 24 to advise them of the circumstances and what we are doing. Thank you. So is there a timeline for when you go, listen, this organisation just is, isn't going to be able to meet the requirements or does somebody have to wait till, uh, till 2028 and either time out or something is done at the last minute? So, um, Senator, that would, that's probably a question that uh, is going to be considered through this second anniversary review um, as to what's the pathway for this situation. As I said in the testimony to Ms Clayton, the, um, the, the issue is being examined both by the second anniversary review yep. and by the territory and Commonwealth ministers. So uh, we can't give you um, a definitive answer now as to what happens with those applications because I think the issue is under examination. Okay, thank you. And are people told that when you're the 24, the current 24 applications, are people told that as well, that that um, that it's also being considered as part of the review? Um, uh, Emma Kate McGuirk. Um, yes, a, a broad discussion was had um, with the applicants or their nominees to indicate that um, the department um, was looking at a, a range of things, not only just working with the organisation, but what other options are available uh, to the department or what future changes there may be. Okay, uh, 
thank you. Um, is it possible with your, and I, I did hear the answers, I could hear the answers around the fund of last resort that you gave to Ms Clayton. Uh, I'm just wondering, is is there a possibility that some of those, depending on what happens with funder of last resort, could be dealt with as uh, under funder of last resort? Yes, if that is a possibility. Okay, thank you. Can I go to... I just want to clearly understand what the 14 institutions in the reprioritised uh, group means, because I got a little bit confused with an answer that you gave before, and that is... And that is um, what happens to those applications? Oh, you said there was no no applications for any of those fourteen institutions. That's correct, isn't it? None. Yeah. So yes. So it's John Riley. That's that's correct, Senator. Just to just to clarify. So where an application is withdrawn by an applicant. Um, and it's the only application relating to an institution, um, the basis on which we were in onboarding to them to the scheme goes away. Um, and yep. so we don't we don't continue to impose that, in that case, the 31 December deadline on those organisations. I'm pleased to advise that uh, two or three of the institutions in that category did, however, proceed with onboarding. Where an, inst where an applicant makes a decision to have their application progressed so it goes through to finalisation without that institution participating. Uh, we do continue to onboard those institutions how, if we can. However, again, the, the time imperative goes away. Uh, should further applications be lodged which name those institutions, uh, we go ahead and proceed with, with the onboarding process um, taking into account what progress we've made, that they have a maximum of six months from the time of first formal contact by the scheme. Okay, thank you. Um, can I go to the three, the rest of the 362? My understanding is that where at least one organisation is yet to join. Can, yeah, I'm not, we've had multiple discussions about the fact that some people are covered you know, there was a much higher number than expected of people covered by um, more than one institution or where the application included multiple institutions. Are you able to tell us of those 362, have you got a breakdown of the number of institutions that they cover that are yet to join? Uh, Senator, I've I don't think I can answer that specific question, but I can give you some detail around that group of of applications on hold. Specifically, okay, that'd be great. Thanks. So, specifically in relation to Declaration One, which will encompass the remainder of the 158 priority institutions, we will onboard 31 institutions, and that will free up 110 applications to go forward. Right. Um, okay. And if you will just bear with me for a moment, I will turn to the page where I've got a little bit further information. Yeah, of the applications on hold, as at 15th of January, 15 NGIs, 15 non-government institutions account for 55% of those. Within that, six are onboarding to the scheme as part of the 158 group. So they're in, that's related to the 110 that I gave you earlier. And yep. six are, a further six are likely to be defunct. So they okay. will be subject to further consideration as to whether they are in scope for uh, funder of last resort arrangements. Sorry, how many were defunct? Sorry. Of the 15, six. Yep. Six defunct, okay. Could you take on notice the, the and give me 
you, you, I know you've done it before. Um, give me the number, the number of people or number of applications, sorry, that cover multiple institutions that are yet that cover multiple institutions where at least one or where they haven't, where they're not onboarded yet or not but, yeah, or certainly. haven't joined. Thank you. In terms of um, then going to the number that are in that 362, how many of those are actual defunct organisations? Oh, I don't. Is it just the... No, that's not correct. So, oh, actually, so 68 institutions who are yet to onboard to the scheme appear to be defunct. Of those, 14 are actively considered for funder of last resort. 14 are? Being actively okay. considered for the current funder of last resort provisions. Why aren't the others? Uh, so a couple of things. So there's some criteria which they either don't fall into or they're continuing to be assessed in that regard as to whether they will be. So, okay. Senator, uh, Senator Liz Kippenberg, just to expand on that, um, the current funder of last resort provisions only enable an institution to be listed as, uh, or a state or Commonwealth to be listed as a funder of last resort where there's partial responsibility by the state or the Commonwealth. Yep. So yep. a defunct institution that has no, where there was no relationship to a state or Commonwealth government um, action then we are not under the current provisions able yeah. to list them. So yeah, okay. when I was talking earlier about the review of Thunder of Last Resort, that encompasses those matters as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's that's where I, I figured that, in fact, you've just um, covered the next question I was going to ask. So uh, thank you for that. Um, can I go to, Chair, if it's okay, can we go to the Prince's Trust issue in Fairbridge? Yep, yep certainly. Um, can I go to, can you give us an update of where we're up to? And I particularly want to know what circumstances led to the media story just over the last couple of days about Princess Trust and the, um, them not being willing to pay or the, the issue around the money that's there for the, um, uh, the lead, the compens the uh, court cases, um, and then the issue about joining the scheme. Um, certainly. So, but, um, Reba, what, uh, are you referring to any specific media reports? Could you possibly cite them just so that um, colleagues? I, uh, yep. Yeah, sorry, I didn't see it. it I heard it on uh, as a. Oh. On the ABC radio, I think it was yesterday or the day before, there was mention of the Princess Trust not joining the scheme, but also um, then that ties in with the issue around the... Uh, it comes under border force, doesn't it? Um, reclaiming uh, the money for the uh, compensation cases that were held. OK, so it's an ABC report primarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. I haven't seen anything in writing. Okay, I've, I've not, I hadn't seen the media report, hence my interest. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, I just I just heard it one morning on the on the news. So, thank you. So, um, uh, I'll just say a few things, and um, and then um, hopefully we are happy to take follow up conversation uh, questions. So the the. I, I understand at the last hearing, which I wasn't able to attend, but which our secretary attended, there was a discussion about um, the whether there was scope for our department uh, to work more closely with Department of Home Affairs and um, Attorney General's department to try and deal with the civil matter and the redress matter in a more joined up way. And um, our secretary, um, did instruct us to um, pursue that. We are in the process of um, working with our colleagues in those departments to um, pursue a potential joined 
joined up approach, but because it is a subject of um, uh, mediation and um, uh, legal proceedings, there's not a lot I can say about that. Um, so uh, I can confirm that at this stage, the Princess Trust has um, been uh, pretty clear with us. They do not wish to join the scheme. Um, and that Fairbridge Restored Limited, which is the company that they set up in the UK, um, can't join the scheme. So we are pursuing that other sort of line of action. Um, we're also so could you say, sorry, when you say other line of action, you mean what you, the previous, uh, just your previous, the evidence you just gave in terms of uh, the department's meeting to talk about a way forward. Yes, is that what you mean? With, yeah. Working with Home Affairs and AGD on whether there's an integrated approach with the civil uh, settlement issue, and yes. also considering all other potential options um, for a funder of last resort, etc. Um, noting that. Um, in this case, the uh, Fairbridge did merge with the Princess Trust, and the Princess Trust do hold the records for the child migrants who were sent to Australia and, and um, were in Fairbridge institutions. Thank you. I Can I ask you? There. Sorry, could you say that again? You, you dropped out. Oh, I just, I was, sorry, I was just throwing my answer to a close by saying I don't know if there's much more I can say about that matter, but I'm happy to take questions. Um, thank you. Can I ask, have you, has the department spoken directly to the Princess Trust since yes. we last, Mo you have? Okay. Well, thank we've you. spoken to them multiple times. I'll just check in. Have we spoken to them since the last evidence before Christmas? No, no, no we have not since. Uh, since what we said at the okay. okay, thank you. Um, has what do you know if there's anything that occurred that provoked the latest bit of media? Uh, not uh, Emma Kate McGuirk, not to our knowledge, Senator. Did you hear that? Are you aware of that? Yes, yes, you are. are. Okay. Um, and you didn't, you didn't put out a media release. No one from the department spoke to the media about that. No, no. You, have you investigated where that came from? Um, so the uh, we don't have the particular media um, in front of us, and but if it was commenting on the Home Affairs litigation, um, the Home Affairs would have been responsible for providing any response to a journalist on that matter. So okay, I'm just, I'm, we, we, we worked with Home Affairs apparently to um, provide input to a response, but it would have come through them. Okay, thank you. Oh, you did work, did you, you did work with them? And then they were basically the spokes. I think they drafted a response and we um, cleared it or provided some minor wording adjustment, as I understand it. And um, they would have, um, we sent it back to them. I haven't followed up whether they passed that on to the journalist or how that was handled from then. Can we be, sorry, a question to officials and again to Senator Seward. Can we be a little bit more specific about what media references we're talking about? And so is there a date? Is there a time? Is there a particular story that you can point us to? Or point other colleagues to or others that might be listening? Um, I'll have to find a chair. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm actually on... Okay. I'm just, Sorry, I, just I, don't recall, you... I, yeah, I don't recall seeing it myself, so I'm just interested in the Fairbridge matter, as you know. So, okay. Yes. Yep, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll, actually, I'm on leave, so I heard it while I was on. I've heard it while I've been away, 
Oh, and I see. I'm, okay. I will um, get my office to chase it up, but I'd also ask the department if anything was formally put out, um, are you able to provide us with a copy or do we need to chase home affairs for that? Uh, can I take that on notice? Um, yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms then of, I, I'm aware I've taken up a chunk of time, Chair, so I'll make this my last question. Um, can I uh, just ask, what do you have a timeline for the process that you've articulated, and thank you for that, with the other agencies? Do you have a timeline that you uh, uh, have drawn together for when you expect to have meetings and to try and move this matter along, to try and resolve it in terms of coming to a, a combined um, process? Um, so um, we've had a series of meetings, as, um, as I said, um, following the last hearing, our secretary instructed us to ensure we were working in a joined up way um, and we've been doing that. We've had a series of meetings. Um, there's obviously then um, AGD and Home Affairs have lead on um, the actual negotiation or discussions with the Prince's Trust on the matter. Um, and so um, I would need to um, get uh, their agreement if they're um, to provide any detail on sort of dates or anything like that. Oh, thank you. Could you, if you could take that notice, that'd be appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Seward. Uh, Ms Hammond. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, the line was very, uh, it's much better now, thanks to Secretariat, uh, but I, I've got confused throughout the course of the last hour on some of the numbers and stats which have been put forward. So I think in the opening statement, there was reference to 158 institutions. Of those, 103 are now members. 31 were declared something, and I'd like that explained. It originally said um, 10 were unable to join, but I think that some then changed to 11 and that 14 will reprioritise groups. Can I just have that? I, I understand 103 now members, I understand what that means, but those other three categories, what what are they and how many in them, just so I'm clear on that? Sure, Sen um, Senator Hammond. Um, so it's 31 will, uh, institutions will be declared uh, in the next declaration, so the first declaration of this calendar year. Which but what does that mean? So they'll be listed. So every time an institution joins, they have to be listed in a instrument. Right. Um, and so that will occur late January, as I understand it. And once they've been, once that instrument's been tabled, they are officially members of the scheme. So at that point, all the applications relating to those institutions can proceed. Um, the 10 is the one, and it, I'll explain in a minute why it's changed to 11, but the 10 is the one that we have deemed cannot meet the requirements of the scheme. The reason it's 11 is because um, it's not one of the list of 158 that we were working with to join over the last six months. Okay. The 11th one is actually uh, the Lake Entrance Pony Club, which um, had previously declined to join, so it wasn't on our list of 158. Okay. So, um, and then the 14 are where there's been a change in the status of applications. So as Mr Riley said earlier, someone may have made a decision to draw an application, they may have made a decision to progress their application without that institution. And so those institutions, we don't any longer have a kind of a time critical pressure to get them to join, but we will still encourage them to join. And as Mr Riley said, if new applications come in, we'll recommence that work with them. Great, okay, thank you. So further on the statistics, I think it was 4,246 applications. And of those applications, 362 are on hold because at least one institution named in the application is yet to join, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So what happens to 
the applicants? What, what, what follow-up or follow-through or support are they provided during, um, I'm referring particularly to these 362, when that determination is made? What, what support are they given? So the applicant whose institution hasn't joined yet, we would be in regular contact with them to advise them that there's been uh, no progress on the joining of their institution. Um, um, so it's Emma Kate McGuire. Each um, each applicant is asked how often um, they would like communication with the scheme. So. Some applicants in this um, situation indicate that um, they would like to hear from the scheme once a month to get an update. Some say they don't want to hear from us until the institution is joined. Um, all when um, an applicant is advised that their institution has not yet joined the scheme, um, they are um, uh, invited to um, work with a redress support service. Um, who can provide that ongoing support during the application process if necessary to act on their behalf. Um, if they don't wish to keep in communication with the scheme um, and certainly all of, those, all of those opportunities for support are, um, uh, are outlined to an applicant when they receive the news that their institution hasn't joined. Um, as well as redress support services we also, um, particularly for applicants who have more than one application, uh, more than one institution named in their application, um, we offer them to talk with no more, the free legal service, uh, to look at what, to, to understand what the situation is, whether they would like to progress their application without that particular institution having been joined, to make sure that all applicants are making a very informed choice about what happens with their application in those circumstances. Um, thank you for answering that. Unfortunately, I was disconnected uh, just after you started answering that, but I'm going to rely on Hansard, so I, I won't make you go through that again. Um, I can't ask any follow-up questions because I didn't hear the answer. But I've just got one more question rather than, because um, I, I know that the Chair has questions as well. So my final question is in relation to the period of time. What, what's the average period of time before somebody putting an application in and it being finalised? For those which have been. So I'm just um, asking whether we have that data in front of us, um, of the most recent data. I, I, at one stage it was around um, 13 months was the average time, but 13. Um, I think it's, it's probably best for us to take that question on notice because we haven't more recently run um, run that data since um, that period of time. Um, so I think probably to give you the best possible answer, we're best to take that on notice at this stage to give you the okay. updated. And I said that was my last question, but I, I'm just going back. 4,246 4, applications. Do those include applications which have been resolved to the extent that they're resolved under this process? No. So um, there have been a total of 9,232 9, applications, and of those, 4,971 have reached um, outcome stage. So the they're, they're finalised essentially. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Milton, did you have any questions? Yeah, just briefly. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers, for appearing today. Um, uh, I, I was listening in at the end of Ms. Clayton's questioning, and I wanted to go back to the Retta Dixon home issue, if I may, briefly. Um, I had a question regarding a media statement and I do have the date chair it's the 18th of January 2021 an ABC News uh, article which may have been referred to earlier Retta Dixon home victims in limbo as operator aim barred from national redress scheme at the end of that statement a Department of Social Services spokesman said the fate of 
and I'm quoting here, of the National Redress, Redress Scheme applications relating to Retta Dixon Home would be discussed as an as yet unscheduled Minister's Redress Scheme Governance Board meeting in 2021. I just wanted to, on this issue to know, has that date been established and would that date be in, and if you don't know the date, is it likely to be in this quarter or um, first half of the year or is that just up to the Minister to determine that date? Um, Emma Kate McGuirk here. Um, at the at the moment, that there are active discussions between jurisdictions about availability of ministers. It looks like um, that will be uh, at the beginning of April at this stage. So that's to um, once the second anniversary review has been um, delivered. But also, we need to work around the Western Australian election. Okay. Um, look, just one more brief question from me, Chair, um, and this is an um, individual sort of question regarding process. When an applicant is offered um, a, let's say a letter of offer, is that um, by electronic or post? Uh, or both? Here. Um, Wherever possible, uh, prior to written information being sent, and that is posted uh, to applicants via express post, we do um, uh, an outbound call to applicants uh, prior to receiving that. So we talk applicants through what's involved in the outcome. Um, and um, when we set up that call, we um, ensure that applicants have appropriate support Often that phone call is with their support service or nominee support person. Um, and that's an opportunity to, uh, in a more informal way, talk through what is going to be in sure. that. Not, uh, not, 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 yeah, not, 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 I'm not worried about that process. I'm just actually the actual physical. Um, is the letter emailed as well or the offer just by, I know you said express post or registered post? Um, it's just express post. It is not emailed. However, Is there a if reason? Somebody, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. Um, if somebody has applied through MyGov and there's a, a, a proportion, not significant, that has come through MyGov, there may be some um, uh, some notification, official notification through MyGov, but the letter is expressed. Just noting the and the only reason I'm raising this, I've had a local resident um, who's had terrible problems with mail and even express post and the time delays and the anxiety around that. Has the department given any thought to actually setting up encrypted or proper electronic offers either through MyGov where you could get that letter? I mean, I'm thinking about privacy issues and thinking about people sharing correspondence and mailboxes and all those sorts of things. Um. Yes, we, we are looking at a range of secure email options oh, great. at the moment that would allow us to potentially have broader communication in certain circumstances. And that's a, 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 if, when you say looking at that active consideration, looking at the steps involved, who's got to sign off on that, how would that look? Yes, is that's that a, right. Is that, a, is that a, 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 a sort of a KPI for 2021 to get this up and running or is it just sort of we're going to have a look into it? So there's, I, th I think um, that it is something we are actively looking at and if we can get um, get it resolved this year, we would want to get it resolved this year. Um, I think you'd be conscious that email, um, you know, that there's kind of whole of government kind of practices around communication that um, Services Australia, for example, don't use email because of the security concerns which you've alluded to. Um, and so we do need to work on what would be a robust solution, but we are actively working on it. Oh, great. Uh, no more chair. Uh, no questions from me, Chair. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much. Just a, a few questions from myself. Um, over previous public hearings, uh, we've heard from a number of um, Indigenous uh, support services. Um, and I just was interested to know, uh, given the development and maturing of this scheme thus far, 
what observations the department had regards access to the scheme, levels of awareness and the cultural appropriateness of um, various aspects of the scheme, specifically to Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Chair. It's John Riley. Um, I'll, I'll endeavour to answer that in, in broad and and then touch on some specific. So, we Indigenous Australians are an incredibly important uh, audience for us in the National Redress Scheme. Um, we do find that is somewhat skewed towards Indigenous males, and that provides that brings with it some, uh, I guess, new new challenges. Um, for us to go through uh, and so forth. We have to, the sort of critical points we have within the scheme around that, we fund nine Indigenous redress support services um, to the value of about nine and a half million over three years to June 2021. Um, and during the first two years of the scheme, those services assisted 827 clients, including 6,385 support sessions. Uh, we, there's also training available and support within our other redress support services, including No More, our free legal service, uh, in order to assist uh, Indigenous applicants. We're also building on that uh, through some work we're doing with an organisation called Canvas 3, which has developed some uh, video and poster material targeted either through the redress support services or other, in, uh, other intermediaries. So things like Aboriginal medical services and so forth. Um, in addition, the Healing Foundation is providing advice, assistance and culturally appropriate community-based support materials to other support services, including access to interpreters and cultural translation services. Uh, we're in the process of also of, of expanding uh, and renewing our redress support service funding and within that there's a number of projects either to access new locations or expand coverage uh, to better address the needs of, of First Nations peoples uh, and raise awareness of the scheme. Um, Senator Smith, if please have some words, I just might quickly add, um, we have had consistent feedback that um, Aboriginal communities do feel there is insufficient outreach um, and that there's insufficient awareness. Um, and so notwithstanding all the action that um, Mr Riley outlined, it's not something we're thinking we've got kind of solved. Um, we're working closely with our state territory colleagues on what else is possible what other communication and outreach activities we might look to put in place. Okay, and of course a key consideration here, correct me if I'm wrong, is the the the, uh, the, the, the regional and in particular remoteness access issue that uh, not all Indigenous people will you know, be in metropolitan or uh, large centres that they will be dispersed across uh, the country and particularly across northern Australia. That's a point that's appreciated. Absolutely and um, the minister um, with the new minister with responsibility for redress in the Northern Territory post their election, um, yeah. Selena Weibo uh, made that point very robustly at our last uh, minister's meeting. Um, she has um, spoken to Minister Rustin about it a couple of times. Minister Rustin has certainly taken on um, and asked us to um, come to her with additional ideas um, in order to meet, uh, reach those remote communities in an appropriate way. Thanks very much. Second question goes to the, um, the progress of the second anniversary legislative review, which is now underway. Can you just advise the committee, what is the expected date of that being provided to government and then what is the process for its consideration after that? Um, Gemma Caton's work. Um, the 
report um, is due to the Minister at the end of February. Um, from there, um, the Minister has indicated um, that you know, she'd like to consult her jurisdictional colleagues um, as through the National um, uh, Board about what's involved in that, um, as well as potentially reaching out to discuss um, uh, some of those issues with, uh, with survivor advocates and, and survivor groups. So the process uh, for discussion and consultation around the final report has not yet been uh, agreed or canvassed? So, I mean, it's been, it's least it's, 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 Senator, it's been agreed that the, uh, as Ms. Emma Kate McGuirk said earlier, the um, Redress Minister's Board will meet hopefully around the early April. Um, the intent of that is to have a final report um, that has been received, that has been analysed, and that there's some um, good kind of uh, robust discussion there about what in the report um, is, um, you know, in short term things that we can maybe do straight away versus things that are going to take a longer time. It depends. It's you know, on the extent of the recommendations and the extent of change. Um, so, but in terms of a specific time frame for consultation and finalisation of government decision, we haven't we haven't got that. No. Is it expected that the report after the report's been presented to the federal minister? Is it expected that the report will be released publicly so that survivor groups and other interested parties might be able to advocate directly to their state responsible, state and territory responsible ministers? Or is it expected that the report will stay um, uh, confidential to the federal government and to state and territory ministers? Uh, the minister has um, indicated uh, that the, the report will be made public. That's right. My question goes to, is it likely to be made public before it's presented to state and territory ministers or after? I don't think there's a decision being made about that. Great, thanks very much. I just want to turn to uh, the minister's media statement of the 4th of January 2021. And at paragraph one, two, three, at paragraph eight, I may not have it in front of you, but uh, I'll just read it out. Um, paragraph eight, these institutions and any institution which fails to join the scheme within six months of being notified of its obligation to join are ineligible for future Commonwealth grant funding and will be subject to the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission revoking relevant charitable status. I'm sure you're very familiar with the paragraph and with the, the issue that it captures. Can you detail for the committee what is the process for revoking someone's Commonwealth grant funding and what is the process for the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission revoking someone's relevant charitable status? Now it may well be, now I'm interested, I'm interested in a granular understanding of what those mechanisms are. So if it's, so I think it would be helpful if you were to talk to that, if you can, but I'd also be interested in getting a detailed uh, answer um, by way of um, uh, question on notice if you would, uh, if, if you're happy. But I'm looking for granularity around those two uh, two issues in terms of what is the mechanism. Does it require a decision of government? Does it require a decision of the board? Those sorts of things. But perhaps you could uh, just illuminate us on that. Um, Senator Sharon Stewart speaking. I'll, I'll turn first to the grant funding. Yep. So uh, the government, the Commonwealth government has already taken the decision um, around ineligibility for grant funding for institutions that fall into this category. Um, it, that decision takes effect from the beginning of January this year. Um, it does not apply to uh, existing funding arrangements that are in place, but it, it encompasses any future grant funding. Um, so processes that take place from now on 
the the way that it will happen. As you know, the institutions that fall into the category of um, being in scope for sanctions are listed on the National Redress Scheme website. Uh -huh. um, the Department of Social Services has um, worked with the grants hubs that operate across the Commonwealth and communication has um, gone out to a range of agencies across the Commonwealth to advise them of the new arrangements. Um, the process will be that for any grant process that takes place from now on, there will be need to be a process of checking at two different points. Firstly, um, when grants are received, um, there will be a, a grant applications are received, a bid process to check whether or not they're coming from an organisation on the list, and if they are, um, they wouldn't proceed any further. The second point would be right just before uh, any decisions are finalised to go back and double check the list um, in recognition that the list on the department's web, the scheme website is updated from time to time. So there would be a process of checking um, immediately before any decisions are made. Um, and that, that's um, how the grant process will work. In relation to the um, the charitable status, um, there are two parts to to that. The first is the introduction of uh, the new governance standard um, under the Australian Charities and Not for Profits um, Commission arrangements. That governance standard is uh, not yet in place, but it will be in place, become in place in the coming months. Um, the Treasury Department has been undertaking consultation that it's required to undertake throughout December and January um, with a view to having the new standard in place um, in the coming months. It will be the ACNC who has um, the powers to undertake any action against institutions in relation to their charitable status and they will rely on information on the scheme's um, website as well as um, sort of more granular information that the Department of Social Services will provide to them to make sure that, um, they are, that it's precisely the right institution um, that they will need to take action against. Um, as the standard is not yet in place, we are taking the opportunity uh, at the moment to work through the logistics with the ACNC on exactly how the communication and information flows will work between us and them. So does the decision to revoke the charitable status of an organisation, is that a decision solely of the ACNC or is that a decision of the redress scheme and the Australian government of which the ACNC must implement? Um, it's a, the, the final decision is made by the ACNC um, acting within the regulatory framework that will be is being established by the Australian government and based on information provided by the scheme. But it's the ACNC that has the the powers to take the action. So have you put your mind to or do you foresee a situation where the ACNC might decide not to revoke the charitable status of an organisation despite the fact that the redress scheme and the government might have a view that they should be, their, their charitable status should be revoked? Uh, well that's the construction of the regulation at the moment is, is taking place. Um, it's reasonably clear that if an institution hasn't taken reasonable steps to join the scheme, then they would be subject to deregistration. Um, what we're working through with the ACNC at the moment is what level of information they require from us to um, satisfy themselves around the work we've done with each institution and whether or not they've, they've taken the required steps. But, um, uh, you know, the 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 regulation is aimed at um, that deregulation, uh, deregistration happening if 
the institution doesn't meet the governance standard. That revoking the charitable status, is that intended to be retrospective or just prospective? So for example, if a charity has behaved poorly but been in receipt of benefits because of its charitable status during the time of its poor behaviour, is it intended to make it retrospective or just from the point of revocation? Senator, from my understanding, it's, um, it, it's not retrospective. I'd like to um, confirm that for you on notice, though. Great. Thanks, Thanks very much. At previous public hearings um, uh, and at Senate estimates, I just asked the uh, department for um, for a commitment that all was all was being undertaken that could be undertaken, and that matters regards to Fairbridge uh, were top of mind for the redress scheme. I'm just looking for um, uh, a, a commitment that is still the case. Yes, that is absolutely the case. Um, Great, so we continue to do pursue all avenues in order to um, get get uh, satisfaction for those applicants. Fantastic. Um, okay, I'll just uh, confer with colleagues for a moment, just to make sure. Um, uh, just have a make sure there are no other questions from colleagues. Um, no, there are no other questions from colleagues. So, again, can I thank uh, officials for their participation today, and thank them on behalf of the committee and others for the important work they're doing in continuing to bring the National Redress Scheme to life and all the necessary calibration on the way through. So uh, um, it was very, very pleasing to see those uh, updated outcomes uh, released by the government on the 4th of January. So, But uh, as, uh, as I've said publicly and privately, still some areas for, for focus. But we do appreciate your continued support um, of our work. Um, and wish you all the very, very best for 2021. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. you too. I'll, uh, I'll close this public hearing, but remind colleagues that we're about to um, suspend for the departure of witnesses, and then we'll convene for a brief private meeting.